Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 376 for Monday, March 13th, 2023. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here in Austin, Texas today. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napoma, California, it's Paul Kent. How are we, Mr. Kent? Good. How's Austin? Uh, Austin is, Austin's good. I just arrived here. I was in Las Vegas last week for podcast movement, and I literally flew in a couple hours ago to Austin, got settled, went and saw a movie that we'll talk about, and then sat down to record with you so uh but austin yeah. is good yeah you just hit good how long since you've been there a year i think so i think it's yeah yeah because yeah. i was here for south by southwest south by last, last year. year yeah 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 and i'm here again can for south you, by southwest this year yeah i want to ask you some south by questions can i ask you uh, just, of course because you you're you've gone longer more often and longer than anyone else i know so here's my question is it my perception is that South by started out as kind of a cool music conference and was kind of a cool thing. And then for a number of reasons, Twitter decided to have its coming out party there and it became a tastemakers thing and became a technology conference as much as anything. They still have music and they still have now film, but it's kind of a culture conference now. Would you agree? So you're right that the there there was a, a a moment in time that that definitely changed the way people perceive South by Southwest and therefore the way people approach it when uh, the year that Twitter uh, like you said had its coming out party here Twitter was had not really launched uh, and then it effectively launched here at South by and it was the perfect place for that kind of platform and the perfect time for that kind of platform to happen because everybody's here at this conference. Everybody wants to know what everyone else is doing. There's no easy way to do that. And now here's this technology. Everybody here signs up for Twitter and boom, the rest is, you know, history still being made. Uh, and it was a little bit of a, you know, like aligning of the stars that the right tool at the right time and the right place, right? So, correct. So, you know, as, as music was changing its landscape and, you know, up well, and coming bands were there, right? Well, no. So I, I think it's important to go backwards a, a, a little bit in this story. So South by Southwest is three main conferences and, and has been even before Twitter. Um, there, there's technically four. There's the educational conference. But the main three, I believe in the order that they uh, of their inception is the music conference, which is where bands play for basically five nights a week, uh, you know, up and down 6th Street and around uh, the downtown Austin area, showcasing bands coming from all over the world and play. Uh the second conference that happens uh, that and that that music conference is at the end of South by Southwest. So technically, I think it starts today, but really it starts tomorrow or really Wednesday through Sunday is kind of the uh, the, uh, uh, you know, that that's when it, it really happens. Then there's the film conference, which I believe came second, but has been here, you know, been as part of South by Southwest for a very long time. And that. Uh, now, I don't know when it used to start, but now it starts on a Friday and runs all the way through to the end of the music conference on the following Sunday. So, you know, 10 days or so. And and that's helpful because films take, you know, two hour film, you, you know, you got to pack them all in. So you need time. And then that first weekend, and, and I think we're going back 20 years now. Is when they created the most recent conference, I believe, which is the what they call South by Southwest Interactive or SXSWI. And that existed for a while before the Twitter moment. And it, it was an interesting conference because it really was about like digital creators. They were doing things here, covering things, 
it was the echo chamber for for digital creators before there really was one of those anywhere. But it it was a conference that every year would evolve in some way. And I, I, I think it's fair to say that hasn't ended. That evolution continues to happen at a rapid pace. I mean, every conference evolves every year. But that one really just every year just changes and changes and changes. And you're right. In the past, you know, five to 10 years, interactive has become more about society and culture than it has, you know, digital technology. And, and, and that's probably just a function of how many conferences do we need about digital technology? Like that, yeah. that, that's its own thing now. Yeah. So, so, yeah, there was that Twitter moment, but the Twitter moment didn't really change the music festival. It just changed the interactive part of South by when, when those people leave, which happens tomorrow really, uh, and maybe in spilling into Wednesday again, because I think the interactive rap party is Tuesday night. Um, Austin, you know, it changes here. There's, you go from dad bods to, you know, skinny jeans. And, and <laughs> <laughs> what are you wearing right now? Uh, I'm, dad. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm wearing a, a pullover sweatshirt and and uh, and jeans that are relatively skinny. I mean, I lost forty pounds last year, so you know, dad bod isn't so much there. But you know. <laughs> that's funny. I yeah, didn't, I didn't know that. Good for you. Mm. All right. Well, yeah. So South by you know is an interesting story and certainly a bellwether event in the music industry, and it's a bellwether event in the tech industry. And I, I I'm fascinated by what what made them. Because I know the guy who owns South by South, or you know, started it, Roland. Roland, yeah. And um, uh, he's a musician, and he's a serious, like he's he's the real deal. He's a good man, yeah. Good guy, loves music, loved his music festival, and I'm sure he loves his success that they've grown to somewhere. But I wonder what the leap of faith was that adding an interactive conference. Onto a mu- and again, you said it's a music conference. Is it a music conference or is it a music festival? It's both. There, they actually- there, yeah, there there are panel sessions with musicians and people in the music industry. So yes, it is both a conference and then the festival. And and that is also true of the film festival, which sort of runs the whole thing. Or, you know, runs the 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 time span of the whole thing. There is the conference and the festival. Yeah. Is there any content at all relative to our world about cover cover bands or you know tribute bands or anything like that? Um, I mean, there's there's content for musicians here. Yeah, I've 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 always gotten something out of the the sessions as much as I have about as you know going to see bands and and just sort of immersing in the uh, you know in, in that at night. It, it's the panels during the day generally shows at night generally. There's some spillover, Got it. some exceptions, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cool. And would, would you would you recommend it to most musicians? Well, you know, just seeing the breadth of talent and, you know, the content, would you recommend that it's a good pilgrimage for people to, people to make? Yeah, I, I would. Yes. The short answer is yes. When I lived here in Austin, uh, we bought into the hype that existed in Austin at the time, which we were here from like 95 to like 2001. And the hype here in Austin, at least then, I don't know about now, is avoid downtown like the plague during South by Southwest. And yes, I'm super aware that I need to come up with a better comparison than a plague, given today's world. (laughs) However, I'll take it. Yeah. Uh, And so I never came. And and I I just avoided downtown like the plague. And then I'm just going to keep saying it. Uh, And then one year, (laughs) I was down here during it, it just so happened i was here during south by southwest we had uh, backbeat media had opened an, an office here we we were actually opening an office here and so i needed to be down here to you know set up furniture and and help the staff get rolling and all that good stuff and we had covered south by southwest interactive we at mac observer had covered south by southwest interactive uh, i i believe it's very first year and so there's been a long term, you know, long relationship there. They're always very happy having uh, when when I had the Mac Observer, they were having happy having us there. They're still happy having me here. And so they reached out and said, oh, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll give you a, a press badge, which gets you into everything. And I just had that while I was here. 
And I was sitting in the office on that Wednesday of the week, and Wednesday being the day that the music festival starts. At the off, we'd gotten the office rolling. Everything was good. I was sitting there. like I didn't have a desk because you know the desks were for the people that lived here in Austin. But I was sitting at a conference table or whatever, and I was like, hey, you know what? I have this past at South by. I should take a look at like what's happening tonight. I happen to have a room downtown, which I don't know how I quite worked that out. Maybe they're coming to get me because they found out I shouldn't have. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I looked and it was like, oh wait, Van Morrison is playing at uh, at La Zona Rosa early in the evening, and REM is playing at Stubbs at midnight. I'm like, oh, I I know what I'm doing tonight. Like this is freaking amazing, <laughs> uh, you know. And and so. I, I did that, and then I called Lisa, my wife, and said we were idiots. We believed the hype. We should have been doing this. And I saw a lot of bands, some of whom, you know, the names you know, some you don't. And and that's kind of the beauty of it is, and I've told sporadic stories over the years on, on this show about, you know, sort of the serendipity of South by Southwest. And there's always some band that I see that I'm excited about. It might be a band whose name I knew beforehand. It might be a band that's brand new to me. And I, you know, I just kind of let the, I, I, I sort of craft the schedule for myself and then I just let the, let things flow. And often, mm-hmm. you know, often enough, I will find, I will find myself in a spot where it's like, wow, I had no idea this band was going to blow me away. And then and they do. So if you're into that and you're into seeing live music as much as you are into playing live music, and I, I, I get so much out of seeing music just from the enjoyment, but also I learn a ton watching bands, watching how they change over because, you know, there's like five bands a night at every club. So it's 40 minutes on, 20 minutes to change to the next one. And, you know, just experiencing that, seeing how people do sound checks and line checks and get themselves rolling and then get right into the, the energy of a show. Like there's a lot to be learned if you're paying attention. So I love that. That's cool. Yeah. There's that sound. That sound means that I get to talk about our sponsor, Banzoogle. And we get to take this time to congratulate all of you Banzoogle members for surpassing $100 million in commission-free sales of music, merch, and tickets through all of our websites. I say our websites because we use Banzoogle now at Fling. It's been fantastic. Paul's been using Banzoogle for the House Rockers for a really long time. And it's just because Banzoogle makes it easy to build stunning websites and online stores for your music in minutes. All the features you need are already built in, including, and most importantly, I think number one is these dozens of fully customizable templates. This is what makes it easy for you to get started. You don't have to know how to build a web page. They already know how to do that. You just use their templates and customize them to make the page yours. Then once you've got the page going, the rest of the tools are also important, but that's really number one. You've got tools to sell music, merch, and tickets commission-free, as we mentioned, mailing list tools to grow your fan list and send out newsletters, keeping people informed and therefore showing up at your gigs and buying your stuff. You've got integrations with Bandcamp, SoundCloud, YouTube, Bands in Town, and more so that you can easily add content from your other online profiles. And of course, live support from their musician-friendly team seven days a week. Plans start at just $8.29 a month, which includes hosting and your own free custom domain name. Plus, GigGab podcast listeners, you can go to Banzoogle.com to try it free for 30 days and use the promo code GigGab, that's all one word, G-I-G-G-A-B, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. That's Banzoogle.com, promo code GigGab, and our thanks to Banzoogle for sponsoring this episode. While we're here, I want to tell you again about a podcast that not only do I like, but I've had the pleasure of being on. And this is the Unstarving Musician podcast hosted by Robonzo. He's been on this show, too, back in episode 88. Robonzo started this as a way to help other independent musicians better understand the marketing, business, and creative processes that empower all of us to make music and make a living doing it. Episodes feature insights from Robonzo and a wide array of guests. Topics covered on The Unstarving Musician include songwriting, recording, release strategy, building an audience, music licensing, and more. It's a great show. You can hear it at unstarvingmusician.com or wherever you get your audio. And thanks to uh, thanks to you, Robonzo, for doing the swap with us. All right. I'm going to change subjects. Okay. Raise your damn prices. 
That is my mantra today. I've been thinking about what in our life has not raised its prices in the last year, right? How, you know, your, your gas prices may have come down a little, but they're not all the way down. And I will say they're probably not going all the way down. I, you know, the, the testing of the ceiling that occurred in the, in the petroleum industry, you know, found maybe have found a, 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 a high end, but it's not going down to two and a half, three dollars a gallon, at least in California, anytime soon. You know, how much do you pay for your eggs? How much do you pay for everything in your life that's gone up? Yeah. Have musicians raised their prices, right? You agree? I I agree. No, I, I mean, yeah. It This has, prices haven't changed since I started playing music. And I don't, I, 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 I suppose I, I should qualify that. And I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think I am correct in saying we're talking about club band prices. Like the, I'm no, I'm talking about your, your, what you charge for a private event. I'm talking about whatever you, you know, if you're a solo, your restaurant, whatever it may be. Huh? And this is all interconnected, Dave. So, so my point is exactly this. Are musicians, their own worst enemy. Yes. In, in this, in this issue, you know, I keep hearing, you know, my prices, my, my money hasn't gone up. My take hasn't gone up since the seventies and it is somewhat ludicrous but I will say I've tested it. Like, you know, we do ticketed shows and I test, you know, how much we can go up. And yeah. when the, you know, there's, there's the complaints, but if they're complaining and still paying, you, you haven't hit the ceiling yet. Right. And, you know, obviously the problem is the people who will take the gigs at any price because they want to play. And, but I think more and more that if you bring an audience and you're you got a quality group and you're going to deliver the goods. If you're not raising your prices, you're part of the problem. I, I just really feel firmly. I, I've found a lot of places that ask, you know, what are you charging now? Right? So there is some recollection that the world is just more expensive. And it actually, you know, with gas being what it is, if you haven't raised your prices, I You've mean, actually lowered your prices. What it is, yeah. 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 You, you actually have. Right. Yeah. And, and literally there's, you know, there's a continuum between being bitter about, you know, the lack of musician and, and being proactive about it. Right. And again, you can try to raise your price. And if you have a decent relationship with someone and they say, oh, we can't really do that. If you, you know, stick to your guns and say, well, you know, let me share, you know, everything's gone up. If the answer comes back, said, yeah, I get it. But, you know, I got 20 guys who will take the gig for for what I'm willing to pay. And that's your answer, right? But literally, musicians need to be part of the solution, not just part of the problem. Okay, and so, so if you've done your work, go ahead. And no, I, I well, finish, finish what you were going to say because I'm going to take us. I, I want to explore this, but I'm going to take us down a couple of different avenues. Yeah, I, I think a if all you have is Sweet Home Alabama, you probably don't have a lot of leg to do it. But if you have I think about Adam and the Van Band, right? That just have their act together, a tight, a tight business, right? And, and again, a big part of this, ultimately, it's the flow of money, right? Do you bring a crowd that is going to make someone else, you know, money go up? Um, you know, you really have done a lot of the work in order to justify, your, you know, you setting your own prices, right? All right. If so you've done none of that work and all you have is Sweet Home Alabama. Uh, you probably don't. You're probably not going to be able to take part in this conversation. I, yeah, I don't want to presume that the Adam of the Van Bands uh, or the Adams of the Van Bands have not raised their prices because I, they he may well have. Right? We don't know mm-hmm. that. We we know. I do know that playing in Uptown Celebration, those prices have gone up. Uh, I do know that playing in Bitter Pill. We were being paid more per gig last year than we were the year before. Like I, some of these prices have gone up now. I, knowing though that I was getting a hundred bucks a man, uh, you know, thirty years ago, and a club gig is still paying a hundred bucks a man. That that there's like you don't have to be an economic genius to know that that is not pacing with inflation, right? Uh, so so there is that problem. And my guess is that even if the Adams of the Van Bands of the world 
and 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 original bands are a little and, and we should probably say we haven't talked to adam no. and he seems to be a totally delightful guy yeah, who yeah. totally has his act together we are using him as a, as a placeholder for band that has their act together yes right but i i i i don't want to presume that bands who have their acts together have not raised their prices but it's the but the but everyone at least if you're playing in clubs is subject to the the foundational pricing that is that you know hundred dollars a man in a for you know for a band playing in a club that seems to be fairly ubiquitous across the land here of the united yeah united states so i like that's to me that's where we need to affect change because if you look at touring bands their prices have gone up right like those Absolutely. those bands have changed their prices so it's not the entire industry needs to change its prices it's definitely we can say clubs need to change their prices but but is there an economic support for that uh are are club owners just now happening to make out and i don't want to i don't want to necessarily say that club owners are are uh intentionally complicit in in this uh some of them are and some of them aren't but are are club owners just happening to benefit from the fact that things have stayed at this hundred dollar a man thing or or is is the cost structure such the 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 cash flow such that that actually is still what makes sense i don't think it is because when i share the cash flow with a club i make more generally speaking, than that $100 a man. I mean, I, you know, I talked about that fling gig at the Stone Church where we split the door with the other band because th that was the, I mean, in my mind, that was the, the correct thing to do. I don't, it, it was also the right thing to do, but it just made sense. And, uh, you know, on a night that was organized six days before the gig, hard to get promotion out, all of that stuff. We all did what we could. We had a decent turnout, but it wasn't, it certainly wasn't our best turnout at that club at the Stone Church. I don't think it was the other band's best turnout at the Stone Church, but we still made, you know, 800 bucks or something uh, on the night. And that, you know, that's more than we would have gotten if we said, you know, go and, and pay a hundred bucks, you know, whatever. So I, I th I think I think there is more money on the table. The question is yes, we can we can sit here and rant about it and and don't get me wrong. I I like that. But how do we solve this? Who how, yeah. right because if if there are 20 other bands that are still willing to do it for heck, they're willing to do it for less than 100 bucks a man. They're doing well, there's plenty of bands out there willing to do it for $12 and nachos. Yeah. What you know, how do you fix that? It, it, this is a weird well, thing. This is the, when people say that artists, uh, you know, are, uh, people take advantage of, of artists it, 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 at some level, that's true, but artists also set them it, in this particular example, set themselves up to be taken advantage of. Cause it's like, I want to go play. I'm willing to not make any money doing it. Well, I, this is one horse that's worth beating over and over and over mm -hmm. again. Right. And and I think the first thing is bands have to take care of their business one way or another. Either either and, and I have both of these examples. One, in our most local market, we built a following enough that we could say we'll take the door and you'll have a better booze night than you've ever had before. And uh, and these things were true and everybody made out. I sure. also have one place where I've been playing for 15 years and we built something in that local market. And it's clearly better than most things that this club owner has. Cause he's happy to pay that, you know, he actually put a, you know, we're one of the few bands that he puts a cover charge on to help offset, you know, the amount more that he pays us and everybody still makes out. So I think the thing is like that it's on the table is a really real thing. Yeah. But you have to come, you have to come with something, right? You have to either come with an audience or you have to come with, you know, such a unique, you know, amazing act that you're going to build an audience. Right. So it is not, it is not it, for clubs. Like, like this is different than for, for, um, for corporate gigs. And again, for corporate gigs, I find less price sensitivity 
Right. I find, you know, they ask what you charge and you tell them. And they say, ooh, that's a little out of our budget. And you decide whether you're going to, whether you're going to, you know, if it's a Wednesday night and it's still five, 600 bucks a person, you might, you might say, yeah, like, you know, let, we, let's work something out. Or you might say, nope, I can, I can replace that night with, you know, something that pays better. That's the leverage you should be going after. But literally, I don't know. I mean, I don't want anybody to get in fist fights out there, but, but there is a continuum of where you stand when a club says, I have a guy, I, you know, a band that can do this. And you say, you know, listen, I'm just going to share with you, you know, this is the amount of effort this band puts into it. We have quality gear. We show up on time. We do our business. We make your customers happy. You know, you know, you you have to conduct the business part of it. And I think like there's one guy in in my community, incre- incre- increasingly me, that just needs to say, you know, it's not cool. If you're if you're a five piece band playing for three hundred bucks, you're not helping. And when someone says, well, I you know, you can't tell me what to do. Nope, can't tell you what to do. It doesn't have to be a fist fight about it. Right, right. But you can literally, you can literally be very public and say, "Hey, you know, music is worth something. My music is worth something." And uh, you know, you, you know, if you're doing that, you're 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 part of the problem. Not, you know, uh, we can respectfully disagree about it, but I'm going to let you know my opinion as well. I mean, you know, people are going to have different comfort levels about about putting that out there. But you know, I've seen people say, "Hey, you know, yeah, we'll take that three hundred dollar gig for a five piece band because we do so well in tips," and I'm like. You know what? It's it that it's not that's not it's not the argument. You know, yeah. And I, I've had other people. I, I I know I know someone who's a great singer who takes a gig in a in a high end shopping area, very high end, like yep. like Rodeo Drive high end, and takes it for no pay because she says that the that the tips are so good. And, so so this is know, interesting. Here we're talking about. Uh, you know, musicians being paid more. We're talking about, we talked about South by Southwest. I looked the, uh, the U M a W the union of musicians and allied workers earlier this year said, uh, that South by Southwest needs to pay musicians more. They, <laughs> when, when you are, it, when you are accepted and you pay to apply, it, it used to be that you paid like 35 bucks or 40 bucks uh, back in 2012. Now you pay $55 to, to apply. You don't get that money back unless you are accepted. And your compensation is a, a choice of a one-time payment of $250 or for a band for a band or wristbands for the band to attend the festival now for those who don't know south by southwest it certainly has employees uh and 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 they charge for their tickets and all of that stuff but there is a huge part of their business model that is uh that is propelled by volunteers now volunteers is the wrong term because these people I, I I maybe some people truly volunteer their time and don't want anything out of it. But when you volunteer your time, it, as long as you, put, you know, they, they have a whole, a whole tiered system. I don't have the details in front of me, but the more time you put in, the more you get out of it in trade. And that trade is in the form of wristbands or badges to attend the event. Now, yeah. you know, so, so that there is a, the, like the idea of giving bands wristbands to attend the event fits in with this. Well, you know, lots of other people are doing this too. So I, I get where that mindset comes from. We could have a whole conversation about that mindset, but it is part of what the festival exists and was built on. And, and, you know, it's just there, but UMAW is saying that they should increase the compensation for bands from two fifty to at least seven fifty, And, Include the wristband in addition to financial comp- compensation and uh, end the application fee. I, I, I disagree with ending the application fee. They, you need to prove that you are serious to apply for South by. Otherwise, the number of people who float their bands in would probably go up tenfold. And how are they going? Like they need to manage the, 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 they need to put up floodgates somehow. So I, I, I get the application fee thing that, that makes sense. But, uh, but yeah, 
Yeah, I, I like. I don't it's kind of like the, I, I I would question what is the value. You know, we when we had uh, Buddy on, we were talking about Na- you know Nashville versus L.A. And, yeah, and uh, I went to Nashville and saw a lot, and I hear that they they're not paid, and I'm I'm wondering why do you do it? I mean, why? Because these are people who are trying to make a living on, on music, and I I just want is it is it because the tips are that are that? Oh good? yeah, I've talked I talked to some a perception. Yeah, I talked to some Nashville musicians. Like, like, you know, cover band or, or cover solo artist, street street or even bar musicians, they do get some nominal amount from the bar to play. But that that is dwarfed even on a slow day by tips. So the, the whole tips thing in Nashville is, is where these people make their money. And the, the few. So anecdotally, the few people that I spoke with and this was this was mid 2021 right after the delta variant hit so you know covid was still very much impacting things i think it still is at, at some level but uh but these people were like oh yeah no I, I make i make like i pay for my house with tips it's like okay all right you know so they they were happy with the arrangement for better and for worse yeah yeah, yeah and that's what i'm saying my friend goes to this very expensive shopping area you know, yeah, Gucci, te- Tesla, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. right. Apple stores and, go- and galore. Says, yep, yeah. Um, and you know that person's perception is like I'm making a choice what to do with my time, and me, you know, kind of as a as an ethical, my own ethics, and I'm not imposing my ethics on anybody else. I'm not telling them they shouldn't do it. I'm saying, you know, for me, you know, a place that has Gucci playing rent can afford to play for musicians if they want music in their place. And yeah. you know, that, that doesn't work for me. Right. Yep. Um, but I, I do think a, the, the toolkit, you're like, what are we going to do about it? The toolkit is a run your business. Well, either be so unique that you're going to delight this venue's audience in a way that they're not going to be delighted on a typical night. B do your work. And, you know, is there any part of the music business that doesn't, that doesn't say you need to have a that you need to have a crowd. I mean, if you're a touring musician, you need a crowd, right? I like why why would the the cover band scene say I'm just the I'm just the bar music, you know, and and that's the extent of the responsibility of the band. Grow your audience, you know, have a mail list. Yeah, well, you know, do, yes. Do the basic blocking and tackling yes. that it takes in order to, you know, make it worth everybody's time to have you play at their place. So I, so that would be the thing. I will also I think, share you know, I'll also share that that part's important. Like, even if you are playing places where the the understanding on uh, from all parties is that you are there to entertain the venue's crowd, right? You know, that old real pizza where I used to play all the time before they, they changed things around. Um, they, they, they brought us in and other bands in to, to you know, to play for their crowd. Uh, But we still did the blocking and tackling of, you know, putting out Facebook events and sending out the mailing list and all that stuff. And certainly we would bring people in and, and that's a good thing. Like the, the, the venue certainly appreciates that. However, there's something I think even more important because everybody that was playing there that wound up in their rotation there, you know, was, was doing that. I, I never had trouble getting a little bit more uh, yeah. for us because I know that every business, including the business of being in a band, is the customer service business. And so making life easy for the people that are handling the logistics of booking you and having you play, making their life easy is something you do have control over. And so do that. Go out of your way to make sure that you are their favorite band to have play, not their favorite yeah. band to have perform. You may or may not be, you know, that, that that starts getting very subjective. But the part you can control is that you are the nicest band. You are the most responsive you are reliable, you know, all of those things that go under the umbrella of customer service. Do all of that all of the time, because not only will it work with each of the venues that you are currently at, 
but people talk and people say, oh yeah, you know, those guys are great to work with. They're our favorite. Why are they our favorite? Well, you know, lots goes into that, but make sure you're doing everything you can to be the favorite. It will pay yeah. off. Every business is the customer service business. I'll, I'll say it again. Every business is the customer service business. Because if you don't have customers, you don't have business. I don't know. Absolutely. This, this is the stuff I rant about on uh, Business Brain. We did that crossover episode. But biz, businessbrain.show if you want to hear more stuff like that. But yeah, I, I, think it's, I think it's important to, to remember that. And yes, we're artists and yes, we're, you know, we get a, we get a pass sometimes for being a little bit quirky. Fine. You don't have to be the quirky one. You can be the straight up one when it comes to the business side. Nothing. You can be quirky in your marketing. You can be quirky on stage as you deal with your fans. You can have your personality there, but when it comes to the business, do business. It's okay to be both. That's my, that's my philosophy there. No, I'm with you entirely. We do uh, those ticketed shows. Yeah. And I make a point because my good friend Dave Hamilton schooled me many years ago. On your break, you're not on break. You're working the crowd. I go and I say hi to every table. If someone wants to take a freaking picture, we take pictures. We joke around. People feel connected to my band. Yep. They're willing to buy a ticket to come see my band. And, you know, what you put in, you get out. If you don't put anything in, you're not going to get anything out. Sell merch, too. I, I know this is going to blow some people's minds. Most of you get this already, but I'll say it because it's important. Even if just one person doesn't yet realize it, someone's at your show, they buy a t-shirt, they buy a CD, whatever it is, a sticker, whatever it is you're selling. As soon as they spend that 20 bucks on your t-shirt, they now have increased their loyalty in your band by spending money on your band because the th we, we humans, and I, I definitely include myself in this group because I am a human. Uh, once we have invested in something, we want to defend it. It is a great thing. And so not only will I wear the shirt with pride, I will go to more shows for the band whose shirt I bought than the band whose shirt I don't have. Right. So if you don't have merch, go get merch. Uh, if, if, if you do make sure you're pushing it at every gig, because that is going to help. I know it sounds counterproductive. You're taking money from these people and you are also getting their loyalty. So add merch to the equation. Doesn't sound counterproductive at all. You wear, you wear your favorite band's t-shirts, right? I mean, yeah, you but are people invested. will you're, like you're your band more once they buy no, your t-shirt. I'm agreeing with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, we're saying the same thing. Yeah, okay. We're, we're, right. we're, I'm 100% agreeing with you. Mm. Yeah. It's good stuff. Yeah. A lot of ranting. A lot of Feed, ranting. Feedback. Yeah, but I feel like there's some, there's some actionable advice thrown in there amongst the rants feedback at gigabpodcast.com uh that's where you're gonna send in your thoughts could be a rant could be an actionable tip could be a combination of the two i just um i mentioned i saw this movie joan baez i am a noise is the name of the movie as you might guess paul sorry i hit the microphone this is not my normal podcasting setup as i'm sure you all can hear with my bouncy carpetless uh area here in my residence in uh it's about Joan Baez. It is a, a documentary. Joan, it's almost an autobiographical documentary. Joan was clearly very involved in crafting this movie, but it's super intimate. She, she talks through her career, but if you don't know Joan's sort of uh, career path and the people she encountered – some things come up almost haphazardly it, as though it, with the assumption that you knew it coming in. Like I, I, I didn't know that, that she and Dylan, Bob Dylan were like a, a romantic item Thanks. for a short period of time. Yeah. Did you know that? I did. Okay. So I, you know, but they were early on. And then as he got huge, they, they sort of drifted apart, uh, it was so it, it was interesting to see like her career path, which was highlighted in the movie in its own ways. But it was as much about that it was, as it was her uh, the, the well, it, she had she she suffered 
and I think it some degree still does suffer from like crippling anxiety. She talked, she sort of worked through that and talked through that. There was, um, she shared a lot of therapy sessions, but in a, in a way that, that was sort of appropriate for the movie. It didn't get weird uh, other than the fact that, that there was definitely some version of abuse that happened in her childhood that sort of headed her down this path. And she acknowledges that, you know, that those high highs and low lows that she experienced before she sort of unpacked all this stuff is, you know, a part of, the artist that she became. Um, and it, it all took place with her telling these stories as part of her decision to end her performing career, which I guess she did in 2018. She played her last show at the beacon theater in uh, in New York. Well done movie. It really it, far more uh, intimate. I, I don't want to say intense because it, it, I mean, there's some intense moments, but it's not, hard to swallow i didn't find it hard to swallow but um but yeah you talk about steve jobs she did not you know i as an apple fan i went in (laughs) expecting to hear her talk about steve jobs at least at some point and no that never came up but she dated in addition to bob dylan uh i I believe later than bob dylan uh, or after she had dated bob dylan she wound up dating steve jobs for a while too yeah that's right um was quite a bit older than him she yeah this would have been the yeah, mid 70s yeah yeah that's right yeah she she just turned 80 she might be like 83 now or something i think if i if i'm right. doing the math right from the movie but yeah 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 she is a a heck of a dancer uh even at 80 years old like the way she moves and stuff she is just a dancer at her core well, fascinating really this I, this I did not know i i had no idea and 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 again i i haven't spent a lot of time studying joan baez but that's the beauty of of seeing these documentaries about people is you really get a you know a two-hour immersion into who someone is her uh she's half mexican her father was mexican or her mom i believe i think i have that right one of her parents <laughs> was mexican one was was um you know, from the United States. So, but, uh, but yeah, yeah. Fascinating, fascinating person. And, and yeah, her, the way her body like moves, like she is a dancer. There is no question about it. It's fascinating. Yeah. I don't know. Those are the things. That's what, it's a good, I highly recommend it. You know, these are the, the, I don't know when this movie is, is going to make it to, you know, a screen in your home, but uh, it'll be there. You got anything else this week, man? Um, House Rockers had a pretty good private gig last week, and it was just, you know, the band is seeing each other a little less. And I told you last time, we're just kind of throwing it to the wind, seeing what everybody does with this a little bit less. And so far, it's actually going pretty well. The guys show up, prepared, play well. We don't, you know, we're rehearsing so much less. Yeah. The time commitment is less, The you know, so it's, very counterintuitive to me, right? You know, trying to, you know, stuff an agenda, my own perspective about, you know, we got to practice and, you know, we got to, we got to turn over the set list and, you know, we got to this and we got to that. We got to get this gig and that gig. And it is amusing to me to sit back and just kind of see how the universe unfolds itself for us for change yep. instead of me. It probably always was doing that. Yes. But I would like to you, think yeah. that I was actually the man behind the curtain. <laughs> you gave yourself the illusion of control. That's right. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. 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 Fling, Fling had, uh, right after we talked the last time that Friday night, Fling played a, a benefit, that benefit for women aid that I talked about. We did it acoustic. There were at least two songs that we played that night that we have never played acoustic at all. And, uh, and they worked out great. Uh, you know, fling fling does well acoustic. It fling also does well electric. Like I don't want to miscommunicate that fling is, is really kind of fires on all cylinders and in, in both, both configurations, but the acoustic thing worked for that room, for that vibe of the event. We played about an hour, maybe a little less. And, you know, it's just nice to, kind of I, I like one of the parts i like about the acoustic thing is 
how much more intimate it becomes. You wind up being able to have conversations with the crowd in a way that doesn't usually work in an electric environment. So it becomes a little more of a hang. Uh, and and that I, I like it. And that seems to work for the crowd of, of people who come to see Fling, which is great. So, uh, but they also like the, you know, fully rocked out version too. Well, it's a show. It's right? a show. Right. Yeah, exactly. You're, you're, t- you're taking them, you're taking them to a bunch of different places, which is something that, you know, you, you have to earn an audience to do that. Right. So if, yeah. if, you know, if an audience trusts you to just, I'm here, entertain me, whether it's plugged in, unplugged, you know, spoken word, whatever it may be, <laughs> whatever it is. you know, yeah. I, you have my trust. I bought the t-shirt. So like I'm here, entertain me. And yeah. And I think that's a pretty cool thing. I'd like to do that with the house rockers for some of our, for some of our outdoor gigs um, where we take a break. So, you know, I think I've told you two hours or less, we play straight through two hours or more, even two and a half hours, we will do two sets. Sure. And I'd like to actually do some of my, you know, better acoustic stuff in that space there and just kind of create something different for people, you know? And, Is there a way that you, you know, could incorporate it, it, not just make it the the Paul Kent solo thing, but is there a way you can incorporate elements of the house rockers in that, you know, in that interlude area, maybe with horns or, you know, something that makes it house rockers acoustic as opposed to Paul Kent acoustic in the middle, just, just to differentiate for people. Well, may, maybe, but the, you know, to me, I wouldn't even take a break for these outdoor gigs. Cause again, it's not like everybody's rushing to the bar. I wouldn't take a gig for a three hour show. I'd love to play three hours straight, but you know, many people in the band think, you know, that they want a little breather. The horn guys definitely, yeah. you know, they have, they need to get, let their chops rest for a few minutes, but, and some of the rhythm section guys also just you know need to stretch their back or whatever they do. I could go three hours, or at least I think I can. I used to be able to. I was going to say, I, but, I, um, I, I think I can too still. Yeah. 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 But um, so the answer to the question is I'd love to just do a broken down, you know, a couple of fun things or, you know, a lot of these things are playing to a lawn full of people. Uh, you know, it'd be great to do, you know, some simple sing along things that would be people would get a kick out of, you know, some classic things. But we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I like the acoustic thing. I like, I mean, again, you know, to the point earlier about getting your crowd to buy in, we had just put out uncorked which is the latest fling ep several people there it was their first time seeing us since we had released that uh to the wild and it was so nice hearing people one of our friends andy he was like oh yeah you know earlier today before we came down i played the whole ep on the big system at home he's like now i want to listen to it in the car and i want to hear it in different places and he he was dissecting the way it sounds and it's like, oh yeah. I mean, it was it was flattering, obviously, uh, and fantastic in that regard. But also, you know, zooming out to the conversation we were just having, it's like, oh, look at this. Like, here's some loyalty that happened because we put out a thing that you paid for, right? Like, it it it's it it works. It, it's it's not a zero sum game. You know, we are putting this stuff out there, and it adds to to people's enjoyment, which then adds to our value. I mean, it all just keeps going up and up and up. It's great. It feeds each other. Right yeah. Out. Yeah. It's How good. long is Fling together now? Uh, Well, Fling existed before I joined the band. I, I think Fling is probably close to 20 years, if I had to wow. do the math. Yeah, it's probably not quite there, but I think it's probably 18 or 19. I've been in Fling for, I think it'll be 18 years later this year i gotta oh go find gosh, the date great. i i know i i I have it on my calendar when i went, first went to russ's house i just gotta look and it is up. is russ the founding member let's say that i i think that's accurate i could be wrong about this i you know there um there were other people i like i i, I think russ has always been part of fling yeah i i think so i mean it was fling was named Whoa. it's a fling is a great name for a band of, you know, middle-aged guys, right? You know, it's it's perfect, especially <laughs> given that most of us are married, right? Like, it's it's perfect. However, it was not named after that definition of fling. It was named after the first lead singer whose name is Andy Fling. Oh, yep. there you go. Yep. Trivia. Yep, there you go. Well, <laughs> 
when still we a see great you up name there on the big stage. Yeah, yeah, still a great name. That yeah. guy has a great Andy Fling is a great name. Andy Fling is a great singer. He is a great actor. Uh, I I I have encountered him in the musical theater world. Uh, you know, separate from Fling as well. So, yep. Yeah. Cool. Well, good. Cheers to twenty more good years. I hey, why not? Yeah, why not? Why not? Yeah. Got anything else? Or are we uh, we good to go? I feel lighter that I got that rant off my chest. I'm glad I don't know about you. I feel. Oh, I'm glad. I feel. It's kind of like a good poop. I feel like. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help it. I've been on airplanes, man. I don't know what time zone it is. Not only did I change time zones, the 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 we had the daylight saving thing kick in. So, but anyway, like a good poop. <laughs> a, diff- a different feeling of satisfaction, but I get where you're, where you're going. So you know, I can't. Help man, it. you're a weird dude. I am a weird dude. It's true. <laughs> you know, it doesn't come out much on the show, or maybe it does. I don't know. Like, what do I? I, I think I keep it under wraps, but it's it's always right there. All right. You just revealed yourself. I did. Yeah. But I didn't, ex- I revealed myself. I didn't expose myself. And that, my friends, is a win. You're a weird dude. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for hanging out with us, folks. <laughs> Make sure to check out our sponsors. Go to bandzoogle.com. Use that promo code GIGGAB. Get 15% off your first year. Paul, what is it we keep saying? Always be performing and raise your prices. 